So let's get into introducing our speakers for the evening. Uh, we have Mr. John Dvorak. I'm so excited to have you, John. Thank you, John, for joining us. Would you like to do an introduction? Talk briefly about yourself, give people a taste, and then we'll go with um, the rest of the Sure. I've been involved with cannabis for 20 years or so with Mass Can Normal, Hemp Industries Association, written a lot of articles, started a website, hempology.org, and I put together a program called the Cannabis Curriculum that I'm working on now. Awesome, thank you, John. We also, he, John's gonna be joined a little bit later by Laura Wiener. Hi, Laura. Hi. <laughs> also, Angela Arena Foster. Hi. Thank you for listening. I will pass the show on to our guest in the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank Beth and Elevate for having me here tonight. Thank you, John. Let's John a big <laughs> What the him? What the him? Or I should say, what is him? Well, I'll tell you. For thousands of years, almost every civilization on Earth used hemp rope like this. During the age of sail, all the sailing ships that were so important for transportation, commerce, warfare, and exploration used cannabis hemp. These tall ships had thousands and thousands of pounds of rope, cordage, and rigging. Their gigantic canvas sails were made out of cannabis hemp. In fact, the word canvas is derived from the word cannabis. You guys can go down to the Charlestown Navy Yard, check out the USS Constitution. It's the oldest commissioned warship in the United States Navy. Go aboard it, and you'll see, you'll get an understanding of how much hemp they really used on these old ships. It's awesome. Hemp was so important back then that the pilgrims brought hemp seed with them to the New World. Colonists were encouraged to grow hemp, and some could even pay their taxes with hemp. Almost 400 years ago, in Raleigh, Massachusetts, up near Newburyport, they grew hemp. That's a long time ago, almost 400 years ago. And also in western Massachusetts, in the Pioneer Valley, they grew a lot of hemp all up and down the Connecticut River. So when you do go, okay, sorry. Hemp farming never really caught on in New England, though. They, they tried to get the colonists to grow it, but it never caught on because American farmers could not compete with Russian hemp. Russian hemp was much higher quality and much less expensive. So we imported huge amounts of hemp fiber from Russia, twisted it into rope for these sailing ships. So when you do go down to Charlestown to see old Ironsides, make sure you check out the rope walk. You know, what's a rope walk? Well, it's a quarter mile long building made out of granite. It runs along underneath the Tobin Bridge. And they made rope there starting in 1838 using hemp fiber. It's amazing. They're converting that rope walk into condominiums right now, so it should be really interesting to see what comes out of that. So that was hemp then. What about hemp now? It's about a lot more than rope, let me tell you that. I'm wearing, tonight I'm wearing my stylish hemp fiber Jacket, sport coat, we've got a hemp fiber pocket square that Ellen brought back for me from Europe, which is awesome. Got a hemp t-shirt, rugged carpenter pants from Patagonia, hemp, made out of hemp, hemp shoes, and even hemp socks from the Hempist. Our good folks down at the Hempist on Newberry Street and Harvard Square. So there's a lot of hemp out there. This morning, I greeted the day by opening up our hemp curtains in our house. I did. I sprinkled shelled hemp seed, which you might have got a sample up front, on my cereal. Then I poured hemp milk on that. It was delicious. It's awesome. I also really like chocolate hemp milk. You guys can get this at Stop and Shop. It's really good stuff. I love my chocolate hemp milk. Hemp is the new superfood, don't you know? It's cholesterol free, but it's chock full of protein, fiber, and essential fatty acids. You always hear on TV, 
about how you're supposed to eat fish to get your essential fatty acids, right? No, eat him. It's better for you and much better for the fish. <laughs> this morning, this morning I washed up with my Dr. Bronner's soap. This is really good, hemp seed soap. I had a little owie, so I put on some hemp bees cannabis root salve. This salve is made out of cannabis root, but it's really good for scrapes and burns and everything. Hemp lotion. Put hemp lotion on all the time. You can get this at CVS and Walgreens. Awesome, awesome lotion. So try that out. And, oh, I forgot. We also had hemp coffee this morning when we woke up. Very good. And I put some hemp lip balm on my dry, cracked lips, which you might have got picked up some uh, free sample of hemp balm tonight, or hemp uh, lip balm. Wow, so that's hemp, right? That's awesome. But wait, there's more. <laughs> you can use hemp to make tree-free paper, building materials, biodegradable plastics, like this really cool pen here, and several types of fuel. And I haven't even mentioned the latest rage yet, CBDs, right? CBDs. We've got a great panel coming up later tonight, and you'll learn the ABCs of CBD. Yes, we will. All right. So... When you consider all the things you can make out of him, it's no wonder I call it the green buffalo. That's right. Native Americans used the entire buffalo to survive. They used buffalo hide as clothing and shelter. They ate the meat for sustenance. They used bones for tools and weapons. Well, you can use the entire cannabis plant to make all sorts of essential products too. And that's why I call it the green buffalo. I'm covered with hemp today from her to toe. That's why I call it the green buffalo. Hey, all right. Now, we know, what, we know what hemp is, but where did it come from? That's the $64 billion question. So riddle me this, hempsters. Does hemp come from cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, or cannabis ruderalis? Anybody? All of them. It comes from all of them. It's a trick question. Because hemp comes from cannabis, period. Some cannabis plants are short, stout, and bushy. Some are tall and thin, just like people. There's some differences, but there's a lot more similarities. All cannabis plants have those iconic serrated leaves that are so revered and reviled. They all have... All of the stalks of cannabis are covered with this strong, long, strong, vast fiber. The inside of all cannabis stalks is this woody material called hemp herds. I heard that. This is good stuff. They use hemp herds for everything. And all cannabis plants have similar root structures. And if cannabis flowers are pollinated, they all produce the same distinctive looking seed. Cannabis flowers contain chemical compounds called cannabinoids. Say that five times fast. THC and CBD are very well known, but there's over 100 other cannabinoids have been discovered, and they all have therapeutic effects. There's a couple newfangled cannabinoids hitting the markets these days, CBN, CBG, I don't know if you've seen them out there. Maybe some of our panelists have some experience with that. But we'll find out. So you may be asking yourself, self, can I make hemp out of marijuana? And that's a great question. You cannot get blood out of a turnip, but you can get hemp out of marijuana. It is one plant, after all, and that's cannabis. Okay, the next time you're getting ready to smoke some of your favorite buds, I don't know if people even smoke anymore. Do they? Everything's dab this edible that, tincture, vape oil. But if you do smoke, the next time you're cleaning your sticky icky and you get a stick, a stem, after you take the flower off, look at that stem. That stem is hemp. Break the stem in half and you'll see these little fibers. That's the fast fiber. Look at the inside of the stem, the little white woody part. Those are hemp herds. It's awesome. Those are the herds that you make paper, insulation, plastic, and high strength composites. You can make that out of the fiber. Check out the inner part. So hemp herds have a lot of cellulose, so you can convert that into ethanol 
or compress them into pellets for your wood burning stove. I know everything's sensimia these days. You don't want to get seeds in your flowers, but if you do, you can pop one in your mouth and have a tasty hemp seed. <coughs> hemp seed snack. Okay, so let's get down to why you came here tonight. The Farm Bill, 2018 Farm Bill. Snooze. No. But it's very important because the Farm Bill basically legalized hemp on a federal level. And this is very, very important. But what does that mean? It means the Farm Bill defines hemp as cannabis with 0.3% THC or less. It removes cannabis, it removes hemp from the Controlled Substances Act, which means it's no longer classified as a Schedule I narcotic like marijuana. It takes the DEA out of the loop regarding enforcement, which is great, and it hands regulatory authority over to the USDA, which is much more appropriate. The Farm Bill allows states to create their own programs reg regulating hemp cultivation. So Massachusetts is going to have to create their own program. It provides for crop insurance and funding for research, which is awesome. So that sounds pretty good, right? And it is. Descheduling hemp removes many of what I call the Catch-422 restrictions that have been placed on it because of its relation to marijuana. Hemp cultivation is going to boom this year. It already <coughs> It tripled last year. In 2017, we grew 25,000 acres in America. Last year, 75,000 acres. So this year, it's going to be a lot bigger because of this hemp bill passing. However, we still got a lot of work to do before our farmers can grow hemp with minimal restrictions. I believe one of the biggest long-term obstacles involves this definition of hemp. Our government says hemp is cannabis with 0.3% THC or less. I say hemp is cannabis, period. It's just that simple. The 0.3% requirement is arbitrary and it reeks of reefer madness. Why is everyone so afraid of this plant? It's not plutonium, people, for sure. Hemp is hot right now, right? No question about it. You hear it on the news. It's hot, hot, hot. But have you ever heard of hot hemp? Anybody know what hot hemp is? It's high on the THC. That's right. That means it tests higher than 0.3% THC. And what happens if you have hot hemp? You have to destroy it. They're actually making farmers, our farmers, destroy their crops on something that no one could ever get high off of. This is a huge catch-422. We have to change that. I envision a day when farmers will be growing millions of acres of cannabis hemp with different levels and types of cannabinoids. Now, don't tell anyone, but last year, in addition to the 75,000 acres of legal hemp that was grown in America, there were tons and tons more of hemp cultivated as part of the medicinal and recreational cannabis grows. Unfortunately, it's usually considered a waste product and thrown away. Most growers have to pay. It's a hassle and an expense to get rid of these stalks. It's, in my opinion, it's back when the restaurants used to pay people to come take their used fryer oil away until people realized, hey, you can make biodiesel out of that. So then they started paying the restaurants. This is going to happen in the cannabis space, but only on a much bigger scale. And this is one of many ways that hemp's regenerative effect will positively impact the economy. And I believe it's a unique and possibly lucrative business opportunity. Companies are already sprouting up, taking advantage of this natural resource by turning unwanted marijuana and CBD stocks into hemp products. So, check this. This is a hemp stock. This is from an outdoor cannabis plant in West Virginia. And it's like a chunk of wood. So what do you think you could do with a couple tons of this raw material? That would be awesome. We have to use it. I believe in utilizing all parts of all cannabis plants. Green buffalo indeed. But in the meantime, what to do if, if you guys, one of you want to just grow good old fiber hemp or hemp for seed or grain, as they call it in Canada, eh? Or are you growing CBD hemp, which a lot of people are doing? Where do you get the seed? What regulations do you have to follow? Well, there's a great resource. It's the Northeast Sustainable Hemp Association, NOSHA, and we have a panelist on it tonight. Juliet Agron is the outreach coordinator. She's going to be talking about this coming up, so that's going to be great. On a national level, everyone, if you're involved with hemp, you should join the Hemp Industries Association or the National Hemp Association. 
where the lobbying and education group vote him. They're all doing yeoman's work, laying the foundation for a successful and sustainable hemp industry. Genetics are all the rage these days. Marijuana, thousands of strains of marijuana have been bred and creatively named and branded. Companies like Medicinal Genomics up in Woburn, Massachusetts, are sequencing the cannabis genome so that the exact cannabinoid makeup of each strain is known. Hemp is no different, although the names aren't quite as colorful. You need different seeds depending on what you're growing it for. Breeding programs in Europe and Canada have already resulted in several types of hemp varieties that meet the 0.3% requirement, although with the surging demand in CBD, new domestic strains are being developed as we speak. Okay, now I want to put you all on a modern day treasure hunt. A few years ago, someone told me they saw a patch of ditch weed, which is wild feral hemp, growing along a fence line up in Raleigh. And it got me to thinking, what, what if we could find remnants of the colonial hemp that's been growing wild for, over, for almost 400 years? Colonial hemp sounds a lot better than ditch weed, doesn't it? But if we could locate some of that wild, historic hemp, colonial hemp, it would already be acclimated to the soil conditions and climate. And we could use that as genetic feedstock for tomorrow's New England hemp industry. Another place to search for hemp and treasure would be in Western Mass, in the Pioneer Valley. Maybe you could find some pine, historic pioneer hemp along the Connecticut River. If you're not growing hemp, but you still want to hemp out, I've got some ideas for you. Incorporate hemp seed oil into your CBD products, like the living rose, the healing rose, <laughs> the living rose. Laura and Zachary are doing a great job. They're adding hemp seed oil to some of their products because the hemp seed oil acts, the essential fatty acids act as emollients to moisturize and heal. So it gives your product a one-two punch, a can of goodness. It amazes me going to these trade shows, seeing all these companies selling their cannabis products in plastic containers made out of petroleum. This is super bad for the environment. Well, why not make them out of make biodegradable hemp plastic dew tubes? That would be a much better way to do it. Or hemp paper packaging. It may be more expensive right now, that's true, but it's our responsibility as industry leaders to lead by example and help create the demand for hemp products so that farmers will have more incentive to grow hemp. As farmers grow more hemp, the economies of scale will kick in, price will come down, and availability will go up. So it's a win-win situation. Use hemp paper for your business cards or stationery. This is an easy way to show your customers that you care about hemp and the environment. And I printed these myself. Ten on a page. It's awesome. You make t-shirts for your company. Use hemp fabric. It makes a, a bold and a soft statement. <laughs> I love my hemp t-shirts. Are you building new headquarters or just renovating your office space or add, doing an addition? Use hemp building materials. This is hemp creed. It's a mixture of hemp herds, lime, and water. It makes this wonderful material that's a great insulator. It's mold resistant. Termites won't eat it. You can put a blowtorch up against it for six minutes. It won't catch on fire. And it sequesters carbon dioxide. So it's got a negative carbon footprint. Is that all? Yeah. Let's hear it. I heard of that. <laughs> That's why I love, I love my hempcrete. Use hempcrete. Use hemp particle board. Stronger, more flexible than wood particle board. Inside, oh, hemp insulation. It's better than that pink, itchy and scratchy fiberglass crap. Inside your office, lay down some hemp carpet. Put up hemp curtains with hemp fabric. Upholster your furniture with hemp fabric. Make your countertops out of composite materials. These are awesome. There's so many great hemp building materials. So it's our responsibility to do this and to kickstart the hemp industry. Here's something everybody can do. Use hemp products in your everyday life. Walk the walk, talk the talk. You can find hemp products everywhere. Stop and shop, CVS, Amazon. Go down to the Hempist on Newberry Street or 
Harvard Square. The more hemp we buy, the more pressure we put on our politicians to let our farmers grow hemp with minimal restrictions. That's our goal. Okay, well, I, I focused on hemp today. Make no mistake about it, the entire Canada space is growing exponentially. We're creating a trillion dollar industry, and this is ground zero, so welcome. You've heard of the dot-com era, right? Well, this is a dot-bong era. It's going to blow that away. <laughs> All right, now I know we have a lot of industry insiders here tonight, most of you very knowledgeable about cannabis, which is great. But some of your employees may be new to the industry and may not fully appreciate all the nuances associated with this complex plant. That's why I want to come to your company <laughs> and give my entire cannabis curriculum presentation. It's an hour-long talk that <clears throat> is basically a Cannabis 101 seminar to cover hemp, medical marijuana, and many other topics that intersect with our favorite plant, including history, sociology, political science, public policy, economics, philosophy, as well as the role that strong women like Beth and our entire panel play or play in the cannabis renaissance. renaissance. I'll set up my traveling hemp museum, which is a lot more than this, bring some free hemp samples, and maybe we can even have some hemp ice cream or some other type of cannabis libations. It could be an educational retreat or a hempy happy hour. So let me know if you're interested. I want to end by disrupting you just a little bit. Uber disrupted the taxi industry. Airbnb is disrupting the hotel industry. One plant, cannabis, is disruptive on several levels. We are disrupting the healthcare system by healing ourselves with the humble hemp seed and all those wonderful cannabinoids. Hemp's regenerative power on farming communities could disrupt the agriculture sector, and hemp is going to disrupt the sustainability model with green building materials, biofuels, biodegradable plastic, high-strength composites, tree-free paper, and the list goes on. So come on, you energetic, innovative, free-thinking thought leaders. Let's get out there and do some disrupting. Thank you very much. Woo. Association. We are just starting up a nonprofit that is basically providing an, uh, sort of a psychological umbrella space for farmers, for producers, for manufacturers, for consumers, for people who just want to understand hemp and what it's going to mean for our region, for our economy, for our agricultural systems to come together, learn from each other, form collaborations together. And a lot of what we do is obviously going to be guided by what our members are most concerned with and passionate about, um, whether it's any advocacy that we take on, whether it's any education that we take on, it's really generated by what the need is. So right now, a lot of farmers are coming to us and they're sort of all over the state and they're trying to figure out whether hemp is a viable option for them. And so creating opportunities for farmers to come together, for farmers to understand the marketplace, for the, you know, the host of different processors that are entering the market space to be able to talk to farmers, but for farmers to also be able to sort of understand all the different options available to them, all the way down to the consumer and what, what CBD and what hemp products mean for them is all sort of in the scope of what we are working on. And 
Um, there'll be a sign up sheet on the table. So if you're interested in knowing more or having us reach out to you when we're ready for our membership packets to go out, please don't hesitate to put your name on those lists. I'm Angela, um, and I run a company called Kind Lab. I'm basically like exhibit A of a hobby gone really wrong. I started getting interested in marijuana and hemp just to solve some problems for myself and my family, only to find out a lot of other people have the same problems. So I started producing products and recently opened a retail facility. I have a shop open in Marblehead where I sell um, a lot of the hemp extract, CBD infused products and accessories um, with the idea of kind of getting, giving, having a spot for education, getting people on board with the idea of natural wellness as well as start to get them familiar with cannabis as medicine and um, not as medicine because I'm a retail shop, but more for wellness. I'm supposed to say that. I think my first person is Anyway, thank you. Hi, my name is Ellen Brown. I'm the founder of Sensimia Seminars. I'm also proud to say that I am part of the founding committee for Elevate New England, and my passion is education. I have been an educator for um, since 2007 when I started in the United States Air Force as a nutritionist and a teacher. When I got out of the service, I started using medical marijuana, and I realized that there was a need for education. So I moved back to Humboldt County. I learned everything about the plant. I moved back home and I started whole seminars on how to cultivate for yourself, on how to make a myriad of cannabis byproducts. And what I want is for my students to go on to be entrepreneurs or just to impart it into their day-to-day -day lives. So my goal is to set people up for success in the cannabis realm. And now I've started to learn more about the hemp sector, the many uses of this plant, the different byproducts that we can use for this plant. Meeting hemp creed. I'm going to start thinking, uh, what would John do when I start to go about my day-to-day -day life and how I can impart this plant? So I'm here to teach you so we can teach each other. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Beener. Um, I'm on the board of directors for Elevate New England, or Northeast, sorry. And I'm also the president and co-founder of the Healing Rose Company. Uh, we started just about two and a half years ago. Um, all started from a dislocated kneecap injury that I experienced. Um, I re-dislocated it. Originally started as a basketball injury. Um, and from there, we've grown into a five-person team. We're in about 120 stores in 21. Um, you know, self-investment and a ton of grind. We're almost at batch like 800 for our products. So lots of small batches, putting a ton of love into it. And yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. So let's get started. Um, Laura, what is some advice that you would give to an entrepreneur who's in the startup or planning phases? Sure. So um, I think some really good advice is you better be ready to jump in two feet and jumping into the deep end. Because if you're gonna be starting a business, especially in an industry that moves this quickly, um, you better be ready to pivot and you better be ready to pour everything you have into it. Um, and it you know, doesn't, it's not everyone that can do this kind of lifestyle, being an entrepreneur. Um, if working nine to five is what sounds more appealing to you, then I'd say join a really small startup and do that way. If you're ready to work 80 to 90 hours a week, some weeks, then go for it. This is for you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Angela, what's the hardest part about being an entrepreneur? Uh, that's interesting. Being an entrepreneur is actually, and it'll be interesting to see if you guys think, it's kind of lonely to a certain extent, you know? You are the, um, especially, you know, you, you have a company that's been really successful, like Laura, Laura's, you have employees, there are a lot of people relying on you, but you're it. You're the central person. You need to be, um, you're responsible for all the major decisions, and in the end, like, the buck stops with you. So, um, so it can, be, it can be really difficult from that perspective, and in that way, I mean, hey, this is gonna sound really corny, but that's one reason why I love Elevate, too. It's just really great to have a support system of people who understand the industry. <coughs> it can help you out, can commiserate, you know, when the FDA goes sideways, or, you know, they party with you when the you know, farm bill gets signed, and that kind of thing. So make sure you have a support structure, because it can be very stressful. Julia. To, um, can you just give us a little bit more in info about what no NOSHA is doing and how you know who you are looking for to join or what type yeah, of people? Absolutely. Um, I mean, honestly, there's no limits to who I think should be part of NOSHA. Um, hemp, I think, is has the potential to be an incredible regenerative agent for the Northeast region. We have small farms that just aren't surviving. Every day, I talk to farmers that are having a hard time making ends meet. And every day I talk to kids who want to farm, 
but they, you know, they can't afford the land and justify the purchases. And so hemp has an amazing capacity to make an impact in the small farm and the family farms that New England has come to cherish so much that we're so known for in our region. But you know, whether we're talking about the farmers in Maine or in Massachusetts is hard. And hemp has both a uh, really meaningful impact economically, potentially, but also in terms of the way it can be farmed. It really, really allows for regenerative farming practices, and it really allows for organic or beyond organic practices to really spread throughout New England, which I think is part of um, both the culture of farming that I think is really developed here, but also I think what's really, uh, what sustainable really means. In the long run, if we are denuding our soil with our agriculture, we're not sustainable. So hemp really makes sense in terms of the, the sustaining of farms in New England and in terms of the sustainability of our agricultural systems and our economical systems. So first of all, anybody who believes in those should be coming to talk to NOSHA. But uh, more to the point then we go on to, there's this, there's this huge wave of processing and manufacturing and people are trying to figure out how to fit hemp into their existing products or whether hemp is a potential for a startup, for entrepreneurship. And NOSHA is a great place for collaboration and education for, you know, for that level of hemp entering the marketplace. And then there's the consumers who are, are the bottom line, that's all of us. So, and I think that there's a ton of education that needs to be done every day. So I've been in cannabis for a long time, but every day I'm still sort of blown away when I meet somebody who doesn't really understand that cannabis and hemp, same thing, marijuana and hemp, same thing, that the plant that we're growing for CBD was primarily reverse engineered for the, from the same plants that are being sold in dispensaries. I mean, not primarily, literally the same plants that are being sold in dispensaries that have been bred to produce you know, that arbitrary number of 0.3% THC. So for the consumers, there's a ton of education to be done and a ton of education that has to be done really carefully right now because of the way federal laws and state laws exist. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of education, our legis educating our legislators, educating our consumers, and then educating the people that want to utilize hemp and grow hemp. So that's sort of everybody as far as I'm concerned. So everybody should be part of NOSHA as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. I really think that hemp could be the game changer that so many people are looking for, whether it's for their health, for their, you know, for their family farm, for their small business venture, whatever it is, I really do. Thank you. Ellen, what role will education play in Massachusetts and globally for him? Education is going to be crucial for the success of this plan, for bringing this plan back into the forefront. Um, I recently just came back from the Asia Hemp, Hemp Summit in Nepal, and what we were learning was that there are people from every continent and almost every country, and we all want to know the exact same thing. How do we utilize this plan, and more importantly, how do we work together to make sure that we're getting the most out of this, that we're turning it into a biodegradable plastic, that hempcrete is now the new concrete, that we're building homes, that we're making sure that every person has their basic needs met, <coughs> making sure that they have clean water, uh, that they're able to have clothing, shelter, and food, and this plan can do all of those things. So education is gonna be crucial, and I love that these ladies and all of us are educators in our own right, so I wanna make sure that everybody's educated and that you can go out and educate everybody else. Dr. Uma has one of my favorite sayings, which is each one teach 10. So if we can just keep teaching about this plan, it's going to make that global impact. Awesome. This might be a question for Laura and Angela, but as far as sourcing your CBD oil, or tell, can you just talk about how hard, what issues have you had with that? Yeah, so luckily um, about a year ago, we found a farm out in Oregon that we work very closely with. Um, so that's been, all good for the last year, but prior to that, um, you know, we dealt with placing an order, paying for it, and taking two months to receive our oil. Um, so it's just, it's a lot about, you know, vetting who you're gonna be working with, um, making sure that when you receive the COA from the, you know, the, the lab or the farm, whoever you're working with, um, that it has not just a cannabinoid profile, right? There should be cannabinoids in there, that's obvious. Um, terpenes, heavy metals, I get the nutrients done, um, residual solvents, missing one, uh, is it? Microbials, yes. So, um, you know, it's important to get all of those things 
you know, from your, your source, and then also do that prior to putting any of it into your products. So um, it, it's difficult. I suggest that if you're making, especially topicals, really consider using full spectrum or isolate, but um, that's really, you know, per company thing. Yeah, it's the same on the consumer side, you know, it's in terms of when you're on the product manufacturing, just know your source and be able to trust that source. So um, the company that I work with um, was one of the first um, to even be selling hemp grown in the U.S. I mean, I remember when it was difficult to bring, you had, everyone was buying European hemp. Um, so then I'm a little superstitious and I've just been working with them for so long. But you do have to be very careful because as you know, the number of farmers increases, so are there going to be people entering the industry that either, that just may not know, may not even be bad intentions, they just don't know any better and they're using something they're not supposed to and, and you know, that goes down to your customers. So just know your source. What about, you mentioned testing. Is, do you, is this testing from the company or is it independent third party? Independent third how, party always. Yeah, so important, right? you want to receive that from your source and then you want to also do it on your own end. So okay. yeah, and on, personally, um, we get it tested on all six panels um, and then we also get another cannabinoid done at an additional lab. So we always make sure we get uh, cannabinoid done at two different labs so that you're able to compare them for your, your formulating. And if you are working with full spectrum, this is something that not a lot of people um, realize. You need to homogenize the oil first. So if you were to get like a kilo of full spectrum oil and start using it right off the top, the cannabinoids will float to the top and you're not gonna have a homogenous mixture and that can really mess up formulations, which I think it's important to put out there. Do you have any comments on testing? Uh, you know, trust but verify. So even if you know your source really well, <laughs> It's always, uh, it's always it makes you feel better to have those, to have your own set of labs done as well so you can compare. That's going to be required by regulations, so we right. get ready. Yeah. Uh, Julia, can you speak speak to sustainable hemp? And what is a sustainable hemp? Sure, well, I think sustainable can sort of be a buzzword, so I think it's actually really important to talk about what we mean by sustainable. So first of all, we think that sustainable does mean the agricultural practices and I think that agricultural practices need to sort of take a broader view, especially when you're talking about <laughs> cannabis. So that also means that you know a lot of cannabis is grown indoors. And right now the fourth biggest draw um, for energy in the state of Colorado is can cannabis production. Uh, sorry, not the fourth biggest, 4% of the uh, power that is used in the state of Colorado goes to cannabis production. So I think we need to talk about how that can be done sustainably. And I think the, uh, the laws in Massachusetts around um, cannabis cultivation do start to address that those issues of sustainability, water management, um, you know, carbon footprint. But for cannabis right now, I mean, for the hemp side of it right now, not a lot of that exists. So I think, you know, developing best practices around growing indoors and outdoors is a huge part of it. Uh, right now, no uh, pesticides can be applied to hemp in Massachusetts, but there are uh, there's laws in the works to allow organic pesticides, and I think working with farmers in general, for a lot of them, this is gonna be a new crop and helping them understand how to grow it using sustainable and organic practices. I spent my morning with a friend who just came back from Hawaii where he was studying, where he was studying uh, Korean natural farming. And he's incredibly excited to start working with hemp, which is a system of um, using primarily for, uh, fermented treatments to, that can be applied to, you know, to, um, to the soil and to your plants. And everything that they use in Korean natural farming is edible. I mean, it's so safe that you could eat it. So the idea of being able to grow commercially large scale crops using amendments that are that, you know, that are that safe for people, I think is the level that we really need to start looking at if we're talking about growing medicine on a large scale. <laughs> And so I think there's a lot of work that has to be done because we have a lot of small growers that need to figure out how to become large growers and a lot of farmers who need to figure out how to grow hemp. So I think sustainable on that level. And stop me if I don't. No, too that's long. Great. But then and again, you know, and in production, I think how to you know how to utilize a small carbon footprint, how to make sure that there's gonna be a ton of build out in New England and throughout the region to meet demands for hemp and cannabis cultivation and processing. And I think the sustainability of that structure also is something that we need to start looking at. And I mean, cannabis can literally be its own solution, which is kind of an amazing thing when, you know, when it's such a comprehensive product. So I think, you know, and so and I think talking about how, oh, hi, how that product can fit into a larger sustainable marketplace 
paper that is produced from a regenerative product that grows every year instead of trees that take tens and you know and hundreds of years to get back to the size when you cut them down. We've got to be talking about how hemp fits into the sustainability of the global marketplace. So you know, you sort of start to sound crazy when you talk about it because cannabis as a plant uh, affects you know every part of human life. And I think so we need to talk about sustainability on all of those points. But I think if you're gonna talk about, you know, a little bit more like, you know, a little bit more functionally, we need to talk about it in, in agriculture, we need to talk about it in the marketplace, we need to talk about it in, um, you know, how we're transporting it, and that's partially why a regional, uh, you know, a regional hemp association, I think, is sort of where we came to. Because if you look at the size of some of the other states that are farming, Hemp, that's all of New England. You, know, you have to put all of us together. And so I think we really need to talk about regional strategies for how we're going to be uh, sustainable on a global marketplace. And yeah, I think on, every, on almost every level, sustainability. That's great. And one thing I just want to throw in as far as hemp, in my opinion, it will be, we'll be growing a lot of it, but as you mentioned, we'll be processing it a lot in a lot of these old mill towns out in western Massachusetts, that these old brick mill buildings can be renovated and used to process hemp. So if we can grow it here, grow it locally, process it locally, and sell it locally, money keeps getting spent over and over again locally, creating a multiplier effect and a self-sustaining economy. So this could really happen, you know, and hemp could be part of that, a big part of that solution. So Ellen, what are some of the most practical applications of the hemp plant for New England? I think some of the most practical applications for hemp in New England are going to be now that the farm bills passed research. We have some of the best colleges in the entire country, in the world, and we need to take advantage of that. So by being on the forefront of research and by going ahead and being stewards of the plant, doing and living the way John does, where we incorporate it into our food, into our clothing, into our day-to-day -day lives, that's going to start the global chain reaction of what is New England doing and how do we um, replicate that model nationally and then nationwide. Because here in New England, because we have all these prestigious schools and because we're going to be doing all this research, what can you do? How can you get these uh, products put into your local stores? How can you start to use them? Because like you had said before, the importance of supply and demand cannot be undervalued. We are a country based on supply and demand, so if we demand these products be made out of hemp instead of uh, plastic, using hemp plastic, a biodegradable plastic, that could change the world. So um, taking it upon yourself to educate yourselves and to, to make that impact. Awesome. Thank you. Angela, can you, you mentioned a little bit about medicine and CBD, but not being able to call it medicine. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about how hard it is to sort of walk that line, especially yeah. when you're mm -hmm. selling these, these magical products that really help seem like medicine to me, I don't know. Right, but. so you end up doing a lot of customers tell me that, and I hear frequently that and that kind of thing. So you do have to be very familiar with claims, what kind of claims that you make about your products. And there are various kinds. There can be claims for which people cannot val uh, validate on their own, like it reduces inflammation. I can't tell if something is reducing inflammation in my body. I can, however, tell if something's gonna make me sleepy or not. So there's like, degrees of claim as well, um, like ones that you can um, objectively uh, evaluate for yourself and then ones that kind of get more into the medical space. Um, so the way you're talking about them and the way you're doing your labeling is extremely important and can literally be the difference between uh, running a very successful company and starting to get letters from the FDA. So you do have to be very, very careful in that space. Um, reading a lot of regulatory documents is like similar to reading stereo instructions. So that is not your jam, which for most people it isn't. Um, find someone, there are actually some phenomenal people even in this room, but do find someone to just make sure that you understand what you can and cannot do. Um, the FDA, all the government websites have a lot of information, but if that's just too much, um, find someone to work with and make sure that you are very clear where that line is so you can make sure you're not going over it. Awesome. So Laura, uh, Laura usually has one of the biggest tables, the Healing Rose, at like the Freedom Rally, at Mecan, at all these festivals. And I just 
why why do you do that? Why do you and Zachary put so much into the industry? Okay, um, so I think it's really important if you're trying to be a brand out there. Um, it's all about touch points, especially if you're selling a product. So for us, it always seemed the most sense to us to get to as many events as possible, um, always you know giving out samples or having people try the products. Um, and you know at the same time, we also like to support the, all the events that we can. So um, yeah, I think you know it's it's important to do it big too, right? Well, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> we love seeing them almost every show. You try to have massage therapists with us. Yeah, and Make massage. a whole experience, yeah. you know. We're going to have the masseuse. Is the masseuse here? Not today. <laughs> Julia, I know you're working with a lot of farmers. Are, are any of them growing hemp for fiber or for seed, or is it mainly CBD? So primarily right now, the farmers that are talking to us are excited about CBD just because it sort of feels like the next big thing. But I'm actually talking to a lot of people that, um, like very few of the farmers that I'm talking to want to limit how they grow to say they're only going to grow for CBD. Right. And that sort of seems like a sort of an easy entryway right now into the market, and it sort of feels to them like there's an obvious end game. I'm going to grow this field, I'm going to see how it grows, someone's going to buy this because there's high demand for CBD right now. Right. But very few of them aren't open to expanding into growing for fiber. Um, I don't, I, you may know uh, Tom out in Western Mass who is looking to get, put together farmers to grow, her, to grow for her for hempcrete. Specifically, he wants to have enough farmers together to justify a processing unit in Western Mass. So, Nice. Though, actually, the amazing thing about herd is that, uh, you know, marijuana produces more herd than, well, sort of agricultural hemp. And I think mm -hmm. the language that we have to speak about cannabis is terrible because it's all cannabis and marijuana is an awful word and hemp doesn't mean anything. But so, you know, so we really need to like reassess all of the language that we use around it, but for the sake of, you know, simple terms. You know, the herd that's produced by marijuana and hemp that's grown for CBD is actually more viable for hemp free than industrial hemp that's grown for seed or fiber. So I think that literally every part of the plant can be used. And for farmers, that's really exciting right now that it just really feels like an incredible range of possibilities. Yeah. Angela, um, can you talk about what some of the gotchas are? To watch out for when you're starting a hemp business? Sure. Um, my favorite top three um, are banking, finding a bank, which even if you're in the hemp industry, you're like, it's not cannabis, it's gonna be totally fine. It's not totally fine. You, you do want to be careful. I got turned down from four even like state run banks before I found one that I swear, I'm almost positive the guy just didn't know any better and I felt really bad. When I walked out with my little card, I was like, yay, I think it just happened. Um, credit card processing is the same way. I, they will open up an account for you, PayPal, all those guys, PayPal Chase, like just don't even, Squarespace, like don't even try, please just don't. Because what they do is they'll open an account for you, they get wind of the fact that you are a hemp company, they put you on this match list that is shared by all banks, it's basically a naughty list. If you're on that naughty list, they don't care if you're on it for like defrauding thousands of people or like selling some hemp, you are on that list and the bank is not even gonna bother doing research to find out why you're on that list and approve you for hemp. They don't care, so you end up having to go with a high risk credit card processor which is more expensive same kind of people that anyone who does tobacco or lottery or something like that. Just like don't skip that step. Just go to the high risk card processor and like try to get your head wrapped around it. But just be careful with the Venmo's owned by PayPal. Just be careful with all of those super easy to sign up. Like if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. The other thing is just insurance. Make sure that if you're producing products, you have insurance. You're set up as an LLC and you personally are protected as well as you have insurance just should something not go right. Um, so those are always the three things that when people come and tell me, I'm like, you listen here. Um, and I try to make sure that they understand that, you know, those are key things that in other businesses, not a big deal. You, you know, throw up your site on Squarespace, you start taking credit cards, you're ready to go. It's, it's an industry, even though hemp is now federally legal, it, there's still a lot of swirliness there, so you just have to be really careful. Nice. John Obrey, who's an LMV yes. member, is amazing for insurance. Yay. Oh. He got it done for us in like a week. Yeah. He was Superman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ellen, 
I know you mentioned you went to Nepal recently, but I've seen you on Facebook going, I think you went to Hawaii and yes. Vienna, and you're all over the place. What What is really hitting home with you with all these hemp conferences? What's, what's the takeaway from those? The biggest takeaway I've gotten from traveling internationally and getting to meet so many different people from so many different places is that we all want the exact same thing. We don't have to speak the same language to want the exact same thing. We want to see this plant on the forefront and we want uh, global connections. So we want to see what's happening in Ireland, what's happening in Vienna, what's happening in Asia, what's happening in uh, Africa, and how do we get everybody on the exact same page. When I went to the summit in Kathmandu, one of the presenters, uh, I believe it was from Mongolia, and he brought up that a huge problem that they have is that nobody in Mongolia can understand the um, anything we've written in America. They don't speak English. So there's a huge disconnect. Is anybody in here bilingual? You are the people that we need to start making those changes. You have to go out and talk to everybody. So by the each one teach 10, you have to go to other continents and teach them as well and be able to actually put it down in writing so that way they can hand it out and give it to each other. He's like, we don't have Wi-Fi out there. There's not a lot of people that have computers. There's not a lot of people that are um, necessarily educated in the same way that we are. So how do we break that down so that every person and every continent can know that they can use hemp for a fiber, that they can use it as a superfood, that they can use it as a biodegradable plastic and teach them actually how to farm and how to take care of themselves. Uh, in Nepal, they have, um, it's, it's an impoverished country and what they need is infrastructure. So they're gonna need hempcrete to create the roads. They're gonna need it to create homes. They're gonna need biodegradable plastics because when you look in the rivers, there is a bunch of plastic, but it's not going to break down and it's contaminating the water and it's horrible for the environment. So how can we make changes here, do research here, so that way we can help every other country. Thank you. Yeah. Laura, can you talk about what the qualities you look for in new employees? So oh, you're growing. Yeah, absolutely. So we've gone through a ton of interviews at this point, and um, something we really like to look for is that someone has the passion and just really, really wants to be there. Um, that's really important when you're in a startup. Also, making sure that person is trustworthy, um, as, and also as a Basketball player and softball player my whole life, I make sure someone's ready to work really hard, hustle hard, um, and also just be really reliable. I think that's really important when you're growing, um, making sure that person's committed because any kind of turnover at an early stage in a business can literally you know, put you out of business. So um, really making sure that you you know, extend your net, but I, we didn't post on like Indeed or Craigslist or things like that. We posted on like the Elevate group, um, looked on social media for people that already use our products, that were passionate about the brand and what, what we're doing. So I think that's really important, not just to hire anyone when you're building your team. Okay. I've got some general questions for the group, and then maybe we'll open it up to the audience. But what, does anybody have an opinion on the smoke, on the future of smokable CBD flower. I call it no backo. But uh, I know you're a cultivator, Ellen, but have you cultivated some really good CBD? So um, actually in this upcoming year, I'm thankful that I just got uh, hired as the director of cultivation for a farm in Canada. It's 100 acres, 40 hectares, whatever you want to go with. So I'm going to be learning more about the applications of CBD and how to use it and whether or not we're going to use it as a smokable flower. But a lot of times it's being turned into isolate or distillate and being put into byproducts. I think there's always a place for um, consuming medicine, but it's the different ways to get and ingest the CBD into your body. So whether or not you want to use it as a smokable or combustible or a topical application or to start integrating it maybe into your food, that's really where the research is going to be. So I'm, gonna, I'm looking at that. And then one year's time, I'll have a completely different answer for you. But you haven't grown any no, CBD? I, I, I smoke it every day. Oh. I was going to say, I think yeah. it's taken off. I, yeah. I actually love it. So again, the strains that are grown for CBD are also from strains that are grown to be flavorful and they make wonderful smokes. And I love to smoke and I have asthma and tobacco has never been a good fit for me and I'm not giving up my, my joints for anybody. I, I don't care, you can dab all day. I'll smoke more joints than you and I'll be happy and it'll be fine. 
And cannabis, is, I mean, hemp is a great way to incorporate other herbs into my smoking, to smoke a little bit less THC as I go through my day, because sometimes I have things I want to do with a little less THC in my system. And you feel the medicating effects of it immediately. Yeah. So, you know, I use it topically all day long. I eat it all day long. I, you know, I start every day with, I thought Bulletproof Coffee was just like an annoying, you know, just like an annoying thing until I started infusing hemp into my own coconut oil. And now that's all I want to put in my coffee in the morning. So now I'm bulletproof and I'm on CBD. Um, so yeah, I think consuming it in, you know, in a variety of ways is absolutely part of the future of it. And I think it's actually like a really wonderful immediate way to feel the medicating effect. Yeah, I've been seeing some of the hemp flower out there. Oh my gosh, it's, it looks just like beautiful, lovely yeah, like yeah, canvas. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I have that here in my store, just whatever. It's all anyway. But I, I even have it because I like to show people. I'm like, this is actually, like, it's actually a flower. Like, people really, really, really do not know. They don't know what it looks like. So I like to show them just to show and tell, like, this is actually what it looks like. Um, the other thing, too, is with the demographic of people that I get in my shop, I'm like, okay, so when you go to the dispensary, that's going to be a lot different than, like, the stuff you bought in a bag in high school. And you're going to, like, napalm yourself and never want to deal with marijuana again. So maybe mix the hemp yeah. flower and mix the marijuana flower and, like, yeah. just try to chill yourself out. Or, you know, now you can, if smoking is your preferred method, and it's hard in some cases at some dispensaries to find high CBD flour, like, now you have an option to kind of create your own. Um, and the immediate onset is, you know, is a, um, is a great benefit to some people who need that. So, I mean, I think hemp flour, because okay. smokable hemp flour has a big future. And if the FDA is going to really go after food derivatives, then, I mean, flour, extracts, topicals, you know, those are going to be. Good point. Yeah. It is huge in Switzerland, too, by the way. And there, and, uh, there are a lot of breeders that are actually cannabis breeders that are starting to look into how do we grow those higher CBD strains. I know Moss the Seeds is starting to work on some things. So keep an eye out for maybe some of the breeders that you know and love to start incorporating more high CBD strains now that there's, you know, there's always been a demand, but now that there's more of a demand. And CBG strains. Yeah, like CBG, CBN. Any, oh, you all dealt with any of those other CBG, CBN, or? So I've toyed with, I've gotten uh, CBG isolate um, and kind of, yeah, and played with that a little bit. Um, it's really just also, you know, trying to think of what consumers want. I know, at least from a lot of the women that come into my store, it's like the munchies are big. They're like, I want to just sit around and, you know, and a lot of that is the, stigma, the education with the stigma, but it's also teaching them like what cannabinoid profiles and what terpene profiles can you look for to help get you more in the direction that you want and weed is not, just not weed. And so... Um, CBG and CBN are some that are looking in for sleep as well as um, some is for appetite sensation. You know, a lot of people use food to medicate, and so when you give them um, hemp or something else to give them some support, one thing is, like, how do you not go back to some of your other bad habits, which is, you know, eating when you're anxious and that kind of thing. So, you know, anything I can give them that is closer to what they need to, you know, support their wellness goals is helpful for me. CBO. Um, I was also going to say, no matter what it is you're consuming or ingesting and putting in your body when it comes to cannabinoid-based medicine, knowing your endocannabinoid system, knowing how to self-titrate, knowing what is best for you and what's going to work for you, because just like your immune system or your lymphatic system, it's going to be very individualized and very unique. So you want to make sure that if you're using the smokable or the topical, whatever it might be, annotate what you use, when you used it, what time of day you used it. She knows their body. She's like, I don't want as much uh, THC during the day. I'd like more uh, CBD. As for myself, you know, I, I need a, a combination of both. So find out what works best for you because there are no right and wrong an answers with your endocannabinoid system. Awesome. So thought we'd open it up to the audience. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Laura, what are some of the biggest challenges in your manufacturing space? Oh boy. Um, well, currently we're definitely outgrowing our space. Um, so we're at 1,250 square feet right now, and we are looking at a 4,500 square foot facility right now that hopefully we're going to be locking down this week. Hopefully. Um, unfortunately, the hemp regulations on the Massachusetts website are like updated. So the form says hemp is federally illegal. Um, so that's only a thing stopping make sure the landlord is okay. But, um, you know, it, it's all about utilizing the space, staying extremely organized if you're in, you know, especially as a growing stage. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't have too many challenges. We have a pretty awesome team. 
Um, we do several batches every single day of our products, and you know we're, we're cranking it out and filling all our wholesale accounts in 48 hours or less. So, yeah, things happen. <laughs> so a hand back in the back. Questions? Anybody? Yes. Uh, so we've seen like recently Maine and New York ban the use of CBD as a supplement in food, like the food cafes, like CBD smoothies, and this and that. What do you see coming down the line for Massachusetts, and how do you see like the 2018, you know, this regulatory wave that's coming? Mm -hmm. How do you see that affecting that, um, like that particular aspect of the industry? I'll take that. Sure. So I think a big problem with the states right now is they are feeling lost that they're not getting guidance on regulations for their own state programs. So they're just kind of holding everything up. Um, I know up in Maine, there's um, several congressmen that are working very hard to get a legislation passed ASAP to put that regulation in place. Um, so I really think it's just states kind of backing off. And I feel optimistic that um, states are going to start getting their, their stuff together. However, I think there are going to be certain states, you know, like Indian food, but did it do too much? You know, it, it, it's tough. Um, but I, I have faith that the federal government was shut down for almost a month. So that made it really difficult. Um, I, we were in communication with the woman that runs the Massachusetts hemp program, and she's just really lost right now and has pretty much no guidance. Her name's Sarah. She's super nice. If you ever have to talk to her. Yes. Um, I've, I've talked to her too, and she, in their position is that if either the product or the extract or even the biomass to be processed is coming from out of state, and that the pro products don't have like an MA, like hemp license number on it, their position is that it's not legal to process. Have you talked it. since the farm bill passed? Yeah, and she said even with the farm bill. So I'm like, okay, well, what about all these products that are on shelves in Massachusetts? Yep. They're like, and sh this woman literally said, yeah, they're not legal, but everybody's doing it anyway, and it's like a ask for forgiveness rather than permission thing. The, right <laughs> the new forms allow you, you know, we've talked about this, on the yeah. bottom it says if you get your extract from a federally legal source, um, so that's like on the new regulations, and we, I mean, maybe yeah. she's giving different answers, because when we talk to her, I don't know. She pointed it out, and she's like, she's, I think it's maybe, she, like you said, the lack of guidance, lack of education. Though. She's like very overwhelmed, and it's yeah, just kind of like, it. yeah, the, you know, states tend to be on the conservative side when they're running these types of things. So. One, sorry, one thing yeah. that she's been really clear about from the very beginning <clears throat> is that they don't think that the policies that are currently in place are the final policies around it. It's always interim. interim yeah, interim, she's, re she's she really open. <laughs> like, you, like you both said, she's really open to feedback. She's really listening to the farmers and to the processors and to the manufacturers that are talking to her and trying to come up with a long-term vision for the state. I really do believe mm -hmm. that she absolutely has the state's program best interest at heart. And yeah. she's, she's sort of caught, I mean, I once asked her directly, I'm like, so are you telling me that you know, and, like it's a changing thing. At one point, she said, "If you want a manufacturer's license in Massachusetts, all of your product has to be grown in Massachusetts," right. mm -hmm. which made it impossible to get right. a manufacturer's and license in Massachusetts. And then they realized, like, oh, yeah. so then that, so we talked like from the very beginning, we're like, "That's not going to work. There's not enough hemp." And she moved yeah. the bar. Like she's totally <laughs> willing to grow the program, and she is very clear that these are not laws. Yeah, it's the Department of Agriculture. You know, they yeah. have four farmers. They so, want this. You know. Can I just ask? Uh, Question uh, in reference to uh, hemp the building material, how how is that uh, you know uh, how is that working now with uh, the builders or you know is is hemp being supplied in Massachusetts? Question. <laughs> well, not not that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, I've seen some articles about it. Portugal that are going to put on, a man named Miguel is going to put on an entire expo about how to go ahead and start making hemp concrete and using hempcrete. So this is where we're all going to need to come together and find those. I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I need to know how to find the smartest person in the room. So we need to get those people that are pioneering that have been doing this for you know, 30, 50 years and get those gurus to come to Massachusetts. Get them to come to us or we're going to go to them and learn that information and we should all be teaching each other. Right now, I'm not seeing... So there is, yeah. in Massachusetts, out in Western Mass, Tom Ross Massler is uh, pretty focused on hempcrete. He actually has a workshop coming up. I feel terrible that I can't remember the name of his company, just his name. But anybody who 
put your name on the mailing list and I'll give you the information on the workshop. And so like I said, he's looking to build a processing plant in Western Mass. So there's definitely, you can get hempcrete in Western Mass. There's no builders that are building structures with it at this point. I, I just threw that up a little bit. You can't do the foundation, but you can do walls. At this point, people who are doing things like straw bale and other alternative building materials are the ones who know the most about it in our region. And I think you're just going to see it like rapidly. I'm curious how, how is that going to get covered from a licensing perspective? I mean, this, this thing is like zero CBD growth. Right. Or, yeah, when you're not adjusting you know? it, it's a different game. Yeah. But there's not cannabinoids involved. It's yeah. I mean, generally regarded as safe, and that's what the hemp farm bill did. Is it put anything? Oh, it is. Yes, so the like hemp seeds, hemp oil. Hemp seeds, yeah, so. No, just, so, yeah, non cannabinoid. Right. I, I, I could speak to the, the construction standpoint of everything. Right now, the, a lot of these products are being developed in labs and in, you know, pioneer sort of uh, uh, building projects. Uh, but what's lacking is the biomass itself. So if you are to, you can create a piece of plywood out of hemp in a, a lab, but to put it into an action production facility, like, um, you know, what is standard right now with say a comp, a, you know, plywood construction facility, um, you could be out of material within the first three weeks. So what we're trying to do here is, you know, get our agricultural system producing this biomass. And once we have that biomass, then we'll be able to really get, you know, these kinds of production from out of state. If you ask the mass thing, even if you even if you took all of America right now, yeah, there's not enough being grown. It's interesting because I had a company even contact me wanting to like start putting hemp in like 200,000 pharmacies in the um, in the country, and I was like, there's literally not enough hemp to support that. Like, we just don't have enough in the United States, which is why I think farmers is going to be. Like that's the next big push is getting more people into farming and producing more. Hemp. I believe so and too. Honestly, uh, you could truly save the small farm in America. Yeah, yeah it really could. Yeah, yeah. Back of that. And honestly, right now you're going to have a hard time finding truckers who want to bring it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right now is not a great time to be a trucker transporting them <laughs> until some things are a little more clear. Question in the back. So, I was just assume that I'm a farmer and I have three extra acres and I want to grow some hemp. Mm -hmm. What's the market for that biomass once uh, it's available? So, there's kind of a bigger answer. The short answer is you can either find a processor who will buy it from you or you can take it all the way to the consumer. Mm -hmm. that's, that's essentially the answer. And, 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 and so, my, my question really is, how much money am I going to make over those, out of those three acres? So that's a lot of what NOSHA is talking to processors about right now, and I think one of our next uh, one of our next move will be to get like sort of a like a round table of processors and farmers together. Um, we can't obviously entirely facilitate those conversations because that becomes price fixing. Um, but there, so so right now the answer is it's a little like, no one's really sure. I guess that's the short answer for you. There's processors. Uh, I talked to a farmer that had a processor tell them they were going to buy all of their product, they had a price point, they had it agreed upon, they, they went for the license, and then the processor said actually we're building in Kentucky, we're, we're out. Mm -hmm. So it's still a volatile market to be perfectly honest, and farmers coming together is a big part of what NOSHA sees as fundamental to being able to establish some sort of some prices and some standards. There are, there are some industry standards that are out there, the, so the formula is like <coughs> price point for CBD per pound and so on, and there, there's like a bottom level of like three dollars starting at 12 percent CBD or maybe even lower. That depends uh, but, on how many it, it, Exactly. It depends on also what the market can bear. If you have a particularly low CBD cow, you're going to get a much smaller dollar. So it's very market driven, of course, but there are some industry standards. And it starts somewhere about four dollars, you know, per CD point, usually somewhere around like say eleven or twelve percent, maybe even ten percent. It's in that weird range. Yes, sir. We're, we're going with the idea of starting uh, an acre or two and, and seeing what we can get. We're deciding whether it's going to be hemp seed or CBD oil. We don't know how in depth we want to do it right now. But right now, the question to you is, has anybody done some type of study to know the best strain and where to buy the best seeds for CBD in southeastern Massachusetts 
or for seeds to grow have seeds in some semesters as well? So at this point, there's not a huge uh, you know, regional seed market. There are some farms that I can connect you with that are producing seeds and clones. Um, thankfully, the Farm Bill has opened up the seed market, which is, I mean, a very recent and very significant thing because literally you were doing illegal deals like where you couldn't put what you were paying for to get seeds just a year ago. Um, but now, so Oregon is pretty widely accepted as some of the best seeds in the country. So, so. Oregon also has a pretty comparable uh, zone, so actually a lot of New England seeds are coming from there. I'm sorry, was the question how do we get seeds? You no, know, the question was what is the best varietal okay. to grow in southeastern Massachusetts for uh, CBD oil, for hemp seeds, and if somebody wanted to do fiber. Right now we're not really interested in fiber, but. Sure, so at this point for hemp seed, I don't think there's anybody that's growing and in New England. Seeds can come from Oregon. And seeds can come from Oregon. There's farms Oregon. that are growing it now in Massachusetts. I mean, and but it's pretty much honestly, you'll find mostly the same strains. Uh, cherry wine grows really well around here. Boax, you'll see a lot of. Um, I have, cherry wine, I thought, would be actually cherry my favorite, 100%. If I can just throw something in just to answer a couple of these questions. Um, there is somebody here who has access to cherry wine seeds, George. Um, a farm up in Maine, but then also the question about local um, southeastern Massachusetts uh, farms. Um, Bill Downing, Linda Noel, Terrapin, yep. they're farming down in Franklin? Does they're in right? Franklin, and so they have clones and seeds both available. Yeah. They're one of the farms that we're working with. Yep. They will be on the New England Cannabis Convention. They're, they're on a hemp panel on Sunday, um, so that could be another kind of... I also have uh, people who are primarily cannabis geneticists who are interested in farmers growing out test plots for them. So, and I actually think that right now farmers with a small amount of acreage, um, so here's the two things to consider. Growing for seed is huge because there's a lack of seed. And at this point, if you're buying a pound of seed, you need some friends, that stuff's expensive. Um, but seed production means pollinating male, male plants, pollinating female plants. And Anybody who's growing either cannabis or hemp for CBD is not going to like you if you have a field of that. Mm -hmm. So, so you're really looking like so any so farmers with small amounts of land. I really encourage you to look into greenhouse production for seed. I think that that's something that New England really has a lack of right now. There's people who would be interested in working with you to find genetics that are great for our area. But other than that, like honestly, like most of the farmers that I know are just trying one or two acres to see what happens. And um, and yet these are the farmers that are working with. Uh, Terrapin is actually also a co-op, so they, you know, potentially farms can work under them. Um, Boax and Cherry Wine are the strains that you see the most of out there. And I'll just throw an in intent, sorry to keep interrupting. Yeah. I just met a young woman whose company works on greenhouses. Ash. For you guys, if anybody wants, is curious about uh, greenhouse, talk to Ash there. <laughs> yeah. One more question or two? Sure, yeah, let's do two more. Uh, oh, sorry. Number, number 663 of 507. The patent on CBD owned by the uh, US government comes to and all expires April 21st of so this year. What impact will the expiration of the patent have on the CBD industry? <laughs> I just talking about this. <laughs> oh, um, not this particularly. Oh, wow. yeah. oh man, what has it done right now? now? To be honest, yeah. so I'm not sure. They're not enforcing the patent now. What'll be interesting, quite honestly, is if they try to renew it. Yeah. That is now they're fessing up that they know that there's medical and that they're actually looking to renew it. I think that's going to be a big indication if they renew then the FDA is coming in, like yeah. it's a done deal, like pharmaceuticals got to them, it's money time. Uh, if it doesn't, now it's literally like open season. There is no patent, you have, like it's actually just opened up the field a lot. So it's gonna be a really interesting political move to see what happens there. There's actually, there are patents out there. And there are patents. There are two patents that were filed by uh, Two scientists, one is former FDA and former NIH guys, and they have a patent on putting anything into a topical in the US, and they filed in Canada this summer. Nobody's enforcing it in the US because it's cannabis derived and because cannabis isn't federally legal, but 
at this point, I'm not sure what's going to happen in Kansas, and I think it depends on when they decide to exercise their right for the patent. So I, I, I've inquired a lot about this, and nobody seems to know the answer. But there are two patents that exist, and I would encourage anybody that's putting a ton of money into developing their own formulations to take a look at the patents and consult with an attorney. Done on the delivery system that is something like transferable for a topical use? Uh, oil, solves, um, they have an equine patent, they have a canine patent. It's a pretty comprehensive patent. So consult an attorney. Where are they from? Uh, they're, one guy is from Florida and the other guy I think is from Georgia. They're both retired scientists. And they filed again, like I said, they filed the summer Canada. They know what they're doing, but nobody seems to be able to answer the question as to are they going to exercise their right? Are they, you know, who are they working for? I, I, I don't know. If anybody has more information about it, I'd love to hear it. My question is uh, back in the back. With, uh, I guess with regards to law enforcement, so now that we can ship this stuff all over the, com the country, I guess, perceivably, because it's federally legal. Um, you can like just buy, I guess, blood basically from these farms, and it's getting shipped in flat rate boxes, and they literally have to pack it with like a disclaimer to law enforcement, like this is industrial hemp, you know, point three to or less. So like, how is that working? How are they distinguishing between like packages of just like THC rich bud coming into right. your state and you know this industrial hemp and in addition to that, I've seen that their little roadside tests, you know, where they put your bud into a little bag and you press yep. it, it turns, it doesn't, it doesn't distinguish between industrial hemp and, you know, THC rich bud. Right. So how, you know, yep. how are they going to, and it dogs too. Well, I think the answer is it's working poorly. There's two poor truck drivers sitting in jail right now yeah. waiting for the state to decide if their mm -hmm. certified hemp is actually certified mm -hmm. hemp. Like so it's working pretty poorly. In Oklahoma, right? You know, and an yeah. uh, eighth of you know industrial hemp might get pulled over and arrested because it doesn't pass their tests. You know, maybe what's going to happen? They did. Yeah. They, they did. Court, they did bust though. a truck, a trailer load like seventy-five thousand pounds of hemp. It was going from, I believe, Kentucky to Colorado or something, and it went through Oklahoma. Oregon. Uh, yeah, like who's Oregon. educating the law? Well, yeah. it, because, well, so they're getting ed educated through the court system. We'll have to take them to court and mm -hmm. prove it. But it's, I don't know if anybody else has had any other I mean, you won't experience. You high quality CBD flour, like the real deal stuff, you won't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. smelling, tasting, looks, we're in the lab. We got you know, any more questions? I have a question about um, fencing the farm and zoning. Being too close to neighbors. So right now, hemp is protected as an agricultural crop, and there's no local ordinances in any town that I know of in Massachusetts. There, towns can pass their own ordinances, and I know of some that are considering it. But um, as of right now, anywhere where you can grow an agricultural crop, you can grow hemp. There's no rules that you have to fence it. You just have to have a sign up that says this is agricultural hemp. Right. It's actually it's it's a pretty doable process to get license to grow hemp by the state. It's actually one of the simplest state forms I've ever looked at, if you look at a lot of state forms. Um, yeah, you need GPS coordinates. They give you very careful directions on how to get them. Half the people get it wrong anyway. They come explain it to you again. They're really working with farmers. They really are. Thank you. Um, I heard from uh, Emergent CBD uh, in uh, near Pittsburgh that uh, probably because of the limited staff um, at the Department of Agriculture what happens they were going to be limiting the licensing to both the growing and producing. Have you heard anything similar? I haven't, but the last time I talked to them there were like 14 licenses, so I think that's probably changed pretty dramatically now. Yeah, yeah no, I'm not hearing. I would hope they'd say something and we yeah. them, you know. Okay, you start. Last one. I just want to let everybody know um, I'm working with Julia in uh, NOSHA, and also we have an Eastern Massachusetts Hemp Association that's kind of based in uh, Cambridge over here, and our mandate is to promote the hemp industry, help uh, farmers, and educate. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank so you. Anybody who's interested, feel free to talk to me. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Let's give a big hand to John and our family. <laughs> My question, so where do they grow hemp almost 400 years ago? trip by a man named Rick Trojan who went across the United States and really started to uh, find out the information about this plant, the history about this plant, the applications about this plant. There are uh, events coming up like NOCO and the Hemp Summit that are happening in Colorado and starting to branch out. So take it on yourself to travel, learn, educate, teach everyone you know. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. 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 Thank you.